Hi, this is David Voss, CCIE 11372, and in this video we will be covering network address translation. Network address translation, or NAT, allows private IP addresses, which are RFC 1918, to be translated into internet routable IP addresses. So this video will examine the operation of NAT, and then also a variant of NAT known as PAT, which is Port Address Translation. And then finally, we will discuss NVI, or NAT Virtual Interface. The first thing you need to understand when we talk about NAT are the different types of NAT IP addresses. So I created this simple chart for you, which hopefully will help you memorize um, each of these address types. Now, when I referred to inside or outside, um, inside is inside a network, and outside would be outside of your network, such as the Internet. So inside local is a private IP address. And when I say private, I mean RFC 1918. So it's a private IP address referencing an inside device. Inside global is a public IP address referencing an inside device. Outside local is a private IP address referencing an outside device. And then outside global a public IP address referencing an outside device. As a memory aid, just remember that inside always refers to an inside device. Outside always refers to an outside device. When you see the word local, think of that as private. That is private IP address that is not routable on the internet. And global, that should remind you of the internet. Because global addresses are IP addresses that are routable on the internet. Now, an inside local address can be randomly assigned an inside global address from a pool of available addresses, or it can be specifically assigned an address from a static configuration. Now, whatever you choose will determine what type of NAT or network address translation you're using. There are two approaches to NAT. The first is dynamic NAT. Now, dynamic NAT occurs when an inside local address or addresses are automatically assigned to an inside global address from a pool of available addresses. And then there is static NAT or SNAT. And you might want to statically configure the inside global address assigned to a specific device inside your network. So an example of that might be, let's say you have an email server that is inside of your company and you want other email servers on the internet to send email messages to your server, but they need to point to a specific IP address, not one that's randomly selected. So in this case, you would choose SNAT or static NAT and specifically assign a global IP address to represent that mail server. Now, there are many books out there that will show you diagrams of inside local, inside global, outside local, outside global. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse with showing you that. The best thing I can do is actually get you in the lab so you can see from an actual running lab configuration how inside local and inside global, outside local and outside global all work together in NAT. Uh, because specifically, uh, Cisco will be testing you um, not just on these concepts, but more importantly, on how they are actually applied. So how to configure NAT. And then they may even ask you, um, what is the inside local address? How do you find out what the outside local address is? What command do you run? So let's go ahead and go into the How To Network Lab. We're going to be working on router 2, 1, and 4. 1 is going to be our device that we're going to configure NAT on. Router 4 will be our inside device. And then Router 2 will be, in, we'll say, an internet device. So Router 4 will be trying to communicate to Router 2, and then Router 1 will be NATing that traffic. And again, we're going to do everything on Router 1 today. So whether it's NAT, PAT, or NAT virtual interface. So let's begin. So the first thing we're going to do is configure dynamic NAT. 
So on router four, let's just take a look at the interfaces so you understand where we're starting from. Fast Ethernet 00 is sign an IP address. And you can see, just check the routing table as far as any static routes we've added. Our default gateway is going to point to router one. You now router one's fast ethernet interface is 10.1.1.100. Again, pause this video uh, if you need to, to set up your lab correctly. Here's router two serial interface is this is the public IP address 192.51.100.2 that serial interface is connecting over to router 1 there's no need to add any static routes to get this working and then router 1 you'll see the IP address set up on router 1 and you'll see the fast ethernet interface is 10.1.1.0 uh, 10.1.1.100 and the public facing interface 198.51.100.1. So fast Ethernet 00 connects over to router 4. Serial 000 connects over to router 2. And you can see we do have one route in place because we want to set up a static route over to router 4s for their loopback address. So we're not using any IGPs, but we do want to set in one static route because we may we're, we're going to initiate some packets from the loopback interface of router 4 as well. Now let's take a look at the NAT setup on router one. And you will see here on fast ethernet 00, which is the inside interface, we simply have IP NAT inside. That is all you need as far as the NAT configuration on fast ethernet 00, which is the inside interface. Then take a look at the outside interface. This is the public facing interface. And very simply, it's IP NAT outside. And again, that's self-explanatory. Now let's take a look at the NAT configuration that we have placed on router one. You can see here we've set up an IP NAT pool. We've named it ISP pool. So any of these IP addresses, 198.51.100.3 through 14 could be or would be assigned to devices, to flows requesting network address translation. Then we state IP NAT inside source list one. So we're referencing an access list and then we're referencing a pool. Now the pool we've just created, but what is that access list? You'll see here access list one. These are the devices that we are permitting NAT for only devices that have source, that have source IP addresses from these subnets will be NATed. So, for example, if there is a flow coming from 10.1.2.200, that will not be NATed. The traffic will simply be dropped if it's trying to access internet devices. So, but any traffic sourced from 10.1.1.0/24 or 10.1.4.0/24 will be NATed from inside to outside. Again, using the pool ISP pool which we've already defined. So any traffic f coming from those 10 dot addresses will then be assigned a 198.51.100.3 through 14 address accordingly um, as the flows come in. So let's go back to router four. Let's go ahead and just ping the public IP address on router two, or let's go ahead and ping 198.51.100.2. And it succeeds. Again, we're sourcing it from a private IP address. Take a look at IP show IP net translation on router one. And you can see here that the inside global address is 198.51.100.3. That is the IP address that is routable on the internet, but is referencing an inside device. That inside device is the inside local address. 10.1.1.101, which we know comes from the router 4 interface. Now notice here the outside local and global address is referring to the destination address that we're trying to reach, 198.51.100.2. Now back on router 4, let's go ahead and initiate another ping sequence. This time, let's do it from the loopback interface.
And that's successful as well because we've permitted it, remember, in Access List 1. And now I'll take a look at Show IP Net Translation. And you can see here the inside local address. It is sourced from 10.1.4.100. Now, it is assigned 198.51.100.3 because that IP address, although it was used previously by 10.1.1.101, that has since been released, so that was available for use again. Now, let's go ahead and initiate some additional pings off of Router 4, and then you will see that now we have multiple inside global addresses being used. 198.51.100.3. 198.51.100.4, and again, that would go on and on all the way up into our allowed pool up to dot .13. Um, we would continue to hand out IP addresses every time we sent an ICMP packet, or, I mean, even if we tried to, to browse or, or, or telnet, um, again, it would uh, not be selective. All it cares about is where the traffic is coming from the way we have it programmed right now. So that was dynamic NAT. Now let's do static NAT. Now remember, static NAT is used when you need to have a specific IP address assigned to a specific internal IP address. So let's say, for example, a mail server. And on router one, what we're going to do is we are going to create a static NAT. And here's the command, IP NAT inside source static. And we're saying anything that comes from 10.1.4.100 that needs to be represented by 198.51.100.5. So anytime we go out to the internet from 10.1.4.100, it's going to show up with a source as 198.51.100.5. And the reverse is true. If someone on the internet connects to 198.51.100.5, that will be routed to 10.1.4.100 every time. So again, uh, using mail as an example, that would be a good way to host a mail server internally on a, on, a, on a private IP address, but use NAT to allow it still to function and, and other mail servers to communicate with it. Now you'll see if we do a show IP NAT translation, it's already showing up even though we have not initiated any traffic either way. But when you do a static NAT, it's automatically going to show up. This is committed. The inside global address, the inside local address have already been statically assigned. And if we go ahead and ping from the loopback interface on router 4, and then we take a look at show IP NAT translation, you will see you will see that specific flow show up. And again, the outside local and outside global are showing up as our destination IP address. Next is port, port address translation. And PAT addresses a limitation of NAT. And the problem with NAT, well, it's not really a problem, it's just a limitation, is that it does have a one-to-one -one mapping of inside local addresses to inside global addresses. But, you know, what if you're in a situation where you only have one IP address to use? One IP address assigned to your firewall, one public IP address, but you have 100 users that need to get out to the Internet. They can't each wait to use that IP address. So what PAT does, it allows multiple inside local addresses, your private IP addresses, to share that single inside global address. And it uses port numbers to keep track of separate communication flows. So let's go ahead and go into the lab and see how that is configured. So on router one, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all the static and dynamic NAT configurations. So we've, we've entered in um, no IP NAT inside source, no IP NAT inside source static. Um, we've gotten rid of this command, no IP NAT pool. We've eliminated all of that because we just want to do PAT now. So here's the command, IP NAT source list one. So remember, access list one is allowing any traffic from router four, whether it's the interface itself, fast ethernet interface, or the loopback address. Anything that is sourced from those IP addresses destined for the internet 
will use serial 000 IP address and then you use the overload command, which basically is saying, I can support as many flows as possible using the single IP address by using separate ports for each flow. And let's go ahead and hop on router four and let's go ahead and start initiating some flows. So we'll go ahead and we initiated the initial flow and you'll see here that it's working. Now let's go ahead and kick off additional flows from the same device, uh, router four. And we'll also initiate some flows from the loopback address as well. And now we take a look at router one and you can see all of these different flows are supported all using the same inside global address but different port numbers. So PAT is a really useful thing for small offices, home offices where you have multiple users and only one IP address available. It's a common, uh, PAT is a commonly used configuration for, for such sites. Next, let's take a look at NAT virtual interface. And here's what Cisco wants you to know. They want you to know that NVI allows you to do a NAT configuration without needing to specify a specific interface as being inside or outside. So what it does is it performs an additional routing operation. It makes an initial routing decision, then it performs address translation, and then it performs another routing decision based on the translated address. Cisco wants you to understand those three steps. The only other thing that appears from the studies that Cisco wants you to know regarding NVI is how to enable it, and it's very straightforward. And what you simply do is you remove the IP, you, you don't need to use IPNet inside or IPNet outside. So we're going to remove that from Fast Ethernet 00. You just need to type in IPNet enable, and that's how you enable NVI. And it appears from the study books that that's what Cisco wants you to know for the exam. We don't need to go much farther than that. So here's what you've learned. You've learned about network address translation, and then you've performed network address translation in a lab, then port address translation and its purpose, its function, and its use. And then finally, NAT virtual interface, uh, what you need to know for your exam. So not only do you need to know these things for your CCMP route exam, but you definitely need to know them if you're going to be a strong engineer. So I hope they're of use to you as you continue in your craft. Good luck in your studies.